Happy Sunday. I want to uh, say a few words about what our chairperson has mentioned earlier about holiness. Uh, because he reminded me of what happened a couple of weeks ago. I, I met this uh, mother who who somehow heard of our, our ministry here, and so she says she wants to bring her 11-year-old son to our church, and but he refused. And I, and I told the mother off-cuff that, oh, that's because he must think that worship service is boring, and the child goes, yeah, 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 it's very boring. So holiness being boring and dull is a very common perception, even for very young people. But thankfully, uh, Brother Victor did mention that C.S. Lewis, this very famous Christian writer, also wrote in a letter to an American lady that it is strange that people think holiness is dull because they have not met the real issue. They have not met the real holiness. If they have, they would find that holiness is irresistible. Instead of dull, it is actually irresistible. Now, it's a very big topic. There are many reasons why. One of the reasons is because of pastors who are very boring. And so you pass. So I, you know, last week we did mention this a little bit, and and if the pastor bore you to sleep, I think that next time before God, he's going to be punished a lot harder, which is what James three one uh, said. So that's one of the things. The other one, exactly as Victor said, is about relatedness. Whether the experience is a relationship that is real to you, your relationship with God, and that's very important. And I think his illustration was was a app one, the re- illustration of couples who are in love, right? So when you're in love, the outsiders listen to you. It's like, my goodness, you guys are so boring. I see some of dumb things, right? And, and it's true. And one of the things that I always tell you is that when I get stuck in MRT station, uh, in a train, you know, you, you, whether you like it or not, you hear people whisper say nothing to each other. That's one of the worst things, right? And the guy's like, oh, you hang out first. No, I hang out first. You hang out first. No, no, your turn. You hang out first. You know, you really want to take over phone and say, bye, and you know, give it back to you. And it's like, my goodness, are you, can you can be like less boring than that? But for the couples in love, that is exactly the thing that warms their hearts, you know. So it's relatedness. And so that's, thank, thankfully, that's the one thing that, that is brought up to you. And so you, you got to remember that the scripture or the Bible very, very clearly portray Holiness as a positive and happy thing. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, the nine flavors of the presence of the Holy Spirit, it starts with love, followed very fast with joy and then peace. And so joy cannot be boring, you know. It, it is a joyful thing. It, it is just a very different thing because for us, we are in a world where we are challenged by many different voices out there. The other example will be Coca-Cola. I mean, Coke is a nice drink, I suppose. You know, you, you drink Coke. But if you do that every single day and every day, that's the thing that drives you. Something is terribly wrong. Your teeth will be gone, you know. Uh, and so, prayerfully, as you grow older, you sort of graduate to finer things in life. I suppose red wine or something like that. You know, it takes a long, long time to make a good red wine or even a, a, a Scottish whiskey or whatever it is. Remember the Macallan story I told you about? A 62-year-old whiskey. It takes at least 62 years to come up with that kind of whiskey. And so holiness has that essence inside as well. Things that thrills you very quickly are more like Coca-Cola. Very short, very fast. The bus is there. However, it's not something that you want to use for the rest of your life. And anything that's worth something in the Bible is something that you have to work at. Something you have to deal with. There's a process to it. And so that's what I thought I would want to share with you quickly. Now today we want to move on to the next segment which is an extension of last week's teaching. So I've entitled it Weapon of Mass Destruction. You know last week's sermon was on the opening uh, part of chapter 3. And chapter 3 contains one of the most famous theme in the Bible for the book of James, and that is the topic about tongue, how you speak, the way you deal with speech. And this is the longest uh, treatment in the whole Bible relating to tongue. Uh, And so when people think about James, they actually remember a couple of things about James. One will be faith without work is dead. The other one is this chapter relating to tongue. And last week, we actually spent a bit of time more on teaching because uh, verse 1 opened up with a warning for teachers how not 
every one of you should quickly rush to be teacher. And so I wanted to spend some time to explain that. And of course, James was talking about the power of the tongue. And so teachers have to be very careful. And we started out by talking about how the Asian people always put a lot of emphasis on education. So stuff like that you guys are familiar with. And how Chinese especially, we have put a lot of emphasis on education being the way out of poverty. Uh, the Indians also as a culture would do that. And so these two civilizations are civilization that place a lot of emphasis on education, the respect for the wise, the elderly, and things like teachers. And we wanted to look at mainly biblical concept of teachers. And I told you that the Bible has a, quite a different opinion of, about teachers. Not that you don't respect them, but it's even more. Because in the Bible, teachers are grouped together with the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors. And they are very honored position. So I know that in church, sometimes you honor the pastor more. And then there's some kind of a ranking kind of a thing. You think that the reverend is better than an elder. The elder is better than a deacon. And the deacon is better than just anybody without a title. And you can tell that because some people only want the el el reverend to pray for, for you. And so as pastors, sometimes it's a bit of a problem because... You know, we have a counseling ministry as well, right? We have a group of brothers and sisters who are prepared to do biblical counseling. But a lot of people just want to go to the pastor because they somehow feel that if the pastor pray, it has more impact and more power. So get a pastor is better. And so there's this idea that pastors are very important. And then Sunday school teachers are this a small deal thing, not very important role. Not so. The Bible actually grouped the teacher together with the apostles, evangelists, and pastors. And because in all preaching, there is teaching. And in all teaching, there is also preaching. There's a difference between teaching and preaching. When you teach, you are transferring some knowledge across. But when you preach, you are trying to reach in and grab the guy's heart uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ or with a life-changing lessons of truth. So the two are sort of intermixed together. And so the Bible has always treated Christian teachers in the same way as leaders. So when you say that you are coming to teach, when the Bible uses the word teach, it often would carry the connotation that this person is also a teacher. And so we wanted to find out a little bit more also about what dedicated Christian teachers, preachers, leaders should be like. And one of them is that you ought to have the natural and a gift of teaching. The other one is that you must exemplify what you teach. So last week's second responsive reading was Matthew 23. Whole of Matthew 23, you have Jesus Christ scolding the scribes, the Pharisees, for not doing uh, what they preach. But it's also important, also according to Apostle Paul, to have the gift of teaching because not all are teachers. And so if you don't have the gift of teaching or leading, you should not quickly go onto the pulpit and say, listen to me. And that's where the boring pastors come in. If you don't have the natural gift of preaching, if you are a person who stutters, if you are a person who cannot string words together, it's fine, it's okay, because you know every one of us has a different gift. But that does mean that you should not then go up there and try to say that I am given the call to lead you and to, to preach to you. And, and it is an issue actually in today's church. And the Apostle James in 3.1 give the verse that calls us to talk about teaching, that if you aspire to be teacher, the leader in a church, the one who will tell other people how to live life, you must remember that you have double the trouble because you will be judged with greater strictness. This is because many people then in the times of the Apostle James and also now, they want to lead and they want to tell others what to do. And you see that in many of the churches today. Not so much in our church because our structure is a lot stricter, but in some of the more democratic church, like for example a Presbyterian church, where if you follow the constitution strictly, it's like democracy. Any one of you can be an elder if people choose to vote for you. And so like I always say, you kiss a lot of babies, you shake a lot of hands, chances are you will be elected. And remember one of the sermon, I also tell you that if your surname alphabetically is A, start with A, the chances of you being elected is very high. Because in a list of candidates, some of these old people will just take the first five. You know? so, so young, why always last? So the chance is not very good. And, and such things will happen. Um, 
So James is warning you, don't take this so easily. It's not such an easy thing to say that I want to, to, to teach. And then he gave the reason. Because when you teach, you essentially use your tongue. And there's great power and danger in there. And today, actually, we will move into the topic in the subsequent verses and also reflecting back on the earlier verses on what the tongue is. And I ended up to, with some clarification. Christians, based on Matthew 20, uh, 23, in the Reformed Evangelical understanding is that you are always to listen to the words of your teachers and not just look at the lifestyle of the teacher because it is about the word that is to be taught, not the lifestyle of the teacher. Although, of course, from the teacher's anger, he or she will be judged doubly strict. But as a listener, as a member of a congregation, don't look at Pastor Levin Tong and say that, oh, you know, he is the one that I become a Christian. If that were the case, then he will be punished by God, because that's not what it's all about. Uh, we should always be bringing you to Jesus Christ, not bringing it to ourselves. From the other side of the coin, then if he fails personally, or if I fail personally, your faith ought not to be shaken, because you are followers of Jesus Christ, not followers of Stephen Tong or uh, a Yong Teng Ming. And remember that whenever people tell you, do not judge, and so don't tell me what to do, don't, don't teach me what to do, do not forget that the Bible is saying we should not condemn. But the Bible does expect us as sword and light of the world to teach the fallen world right from wrong. And all Christians are teachers for the fallen world. So do not think that these teachings and all those things that I have preached last week apply only to dedicated teachers or preachers, Sunday school teachers. No, we are all sword and light of the world. So all Christians are teachers for the fallen world. And, but of course, there is a difference between teaching your neighbors and your colleagues and the people you meet in the world, the right from wrong and sword and light of the world, and standing up here from the pulpit. So there are quite a difference there. But remember always that for as long as we live, the Lord wants us to exemplify his teaching for the rest of the world. And today we went, we'll go on to the more practical application of the tongue from verse 6 to 12. Let's come to God in the word of prayer and commit the time to him. Father, we give you thanks and praise for calling all of us here this morning. We ask that you grant us a heart that is humble, teachable, open to your word, that we may not resist you because of our own sinfulness or fallenness, that we will turn around like a little child would. Whatever it is that is bugging us this morning, help us to set it aside that we may come and meet you and certainly your word. We ask, O oh God, that you have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, when we talk about the topic of the tongue, we are actually talking about a huge topic in the area of communication. Uh, I, there's something about me that's very odd in that I do remember some strange things from my life. I don't know whether any one of you are like me, but I remember my PSLE English comprehension topic. That's more than 40 years ago. You know, do you? I, I know even last year's exam topic, you probably forgot already, right? The reason why I remember it was because the essay that was used was very unusual. The essay tried to highlight the difference between a human being and a chimpanzee. And the essay said that the key difference between a human being and a chimpanzee is the ability of the human being to use language. And so even though I was 12 years old, it was something that became very strongly imprinted in my mind. That there is a key difference between the human being and the chimpanzee in that the human being is the only being that can use complex language. Now, we speak, you speak, you listen to people speaking, and we sort of take for granted, but I don't know whether you know this or not. The human language is far, far more complex than animal communication. I know some of you love dogs, well, cats, well, dogs more, and sometimes you listen to people, the dog go, wow, 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 wow. And, and the, the woman will say, oh yeah, mommy, hear you. You are saying something, something. My mother does that. Uh, she has this funny little dog in her house. I don't know what, prom promenade or whatever. You know, like look, look like a little fox kind of a dog thing. One of those dogs that every time I go visit my mother, I come to the door, I, 
one day when my mind's not down there, I'm going to kick the dog because, you know, it's like such a small thing and you're buggy, buggy, buggy. And then my mother would talk to the dog as if the dog was speaking. Oh, so you are saying that uh, my son is here or something like that, you know. Not true, okay? I tell you, it's out of question. I know some of you love dog to the extent. I read somewhere that the dog can only listen to two syllables at one time. So if you name your dog Elizabeth, and then you say, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, come here. The dog only hear the word Eli. Elizabeth doesn't count. Don't believe me, go back and experiment. Animal communication are limited in scope. However, human language has limitless expression capability. And animals communicate only very, for very limited kind of function. More instinctive, more mating or food, that's about it. Nothing else, you know, maybe safety, that's about it. Very limited, you can count within maybe your ten fingers, the kind of communication that an animal can have. But for the human being, the communication ability and the way we portray our feelings is infinite, it's limitless. Uh, one example would be music. You know, ever since I was young, I kept thinking, why is there so many different kind of music being composed? It's never ending, you know, it's infinite. It is also part of human expression. And of course, there are many different kinds of expression. You have intrapersonal communication where you talk to yourself. This is called intrapersonal. In the middle of the night, you ask yourself, what, what's my life like this? Why did I marry this person? Why did I do this? Why did I do this, do that? And that's a kind of intrapersonal relationship. And not only by speech, there's body language, isn't it? Husband and wife, I'm sure in the course of your existence together, you would have quarreled and said that. You don't have to say anything. I one look, I know. I look at your face, your look, your eye, your, you know. And it's quite interesting, your eye, just one look. Supposedly, your wife or your husband will know what's in your heart. Interpersonal relationship, when we deal with each other, this one we are familiar with. There are also group dynamics, where a group communicate with another group, a country communicate with another country. Organizational communication, those of you who work in corporation knows that there are gurus out there that uh, make a lot of money trying to teach your corporate to uh, communicate better with each other. Cross-cultural communications as well. And so communication is a very unique part of human existence and we all speak. And because of that, culturally, many people already realize that there are some things about communication that's very important. That under the common grace of God, anyone out there who has half a brain will know that the human speech is something that has to be handled very, very carefully. For the Chinese especially, we are influenced by Confucian's idea of fei li wu shi, fei li wu ting, fei li wu yan, fei li wu dong. Confucius believed in li, which is a generic term, mannerism, but he meant a certain order. And so when our child misbehaves, we always say the child may you know, li mao, may you li mao, means you are not following a certain accepted order. And so Confucius said, fei li means when it is not in order, u, u si, see no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil. The original Confucian idea is fourfold, but this whole three monkey thing is actually Japanese. And the Japanese, like all Japanese attempt, shorten it, to make it more brief, easier to understand, so they make it only three. This is a three monkey that we're familiar with. See no evil, hear no evil, and speak no evil. And so the idea is that if you're able to do all these three things, then your life will be quite good. A more sophisticated kind of treatment is seen in other cultures. For example, Aesop's Favor. Are you familiar with Aesop's Favor? We read all this to our children, storybook, and very few people actually know that behind Aesop's Favor are very deep wisdom. The one we are most familiar with would be the story of the tortoise and the hare, and I think all of you would know this story. What's the moral of the story? Better to be a tortoise than a rabbit, no. Slow and steady win the race. Okay, not always the case, but as of people say so. And then there are other like the lion and the the rat and uh, who, who come and rescue the lion. A lot of kind of story. So Absol's favor are stories that tell us wisdoms of life, so to speak. And uh, Aesop's, by tradition, was actually a slave. 
according to Aristotle, Esau was born about 600 years before our Lord Jesus Christ. And so from a slave came many stories of great wisdom. One of Esau's favor relating to the tongue is less known, and that is the favor of the tongue by Esau. Esau's master supposedly is a philosopher by the name of Zactus. And so Zactus told Esau that, hey, you know, I have other philosopher friends coming to our house tonight. And so you as a slave, you go out there and go and prepare for me good, sweet and savory feast for all the philosophers that will come to my house. And so Aesop went to the market and came back and prepared the meal. And so when the philosopher's guests come, the good, sweet and savory dish was presented by Aesop. The first thing he presented was beef tongue in vinegar and salt. Don't ask me why, it's a Greek thing. And, and so the guests were very happy, you know, a good, sweet and savory kind of dish. The second dish is pig tongue. And the third dish is goat tongue. So all are tongues. And so the master Zactus got pretty unhappy and said, hey, what is this? First one, okay. Second one is still tongue. Third one is still tongue. What, what's happening? And Absorb says, you asked me to prepare a dish that is good, sweet, and savory. And the fact is that the tongue represents good, sweet, and savory because every doctrine, every art, and philosophy is established and ordered by the tongue to give, to take, to greet, judgment, merchandise, glory, sciences, wedding, houses, cities, all by the tongue. Amen. There is nothing better or sweeter or more salutary than the tongue. The best of all things is the tongue. And so the philosopher's friends were very excited, very happy because a slave was able to point this out. And so the friends said, okay, then we give you another challenge. You will present to us the worst and the most meager thing as a dish tomorrow. And so when the guests come together again tomorrow, same thing happened. He gave them beef tongue in salt and vinegar followed by cow tongue followed by the sheep tongue. So again, Zactus, the master, was angry and asked, so what's happening? And he said, you asked me to prepare the worst and the most meager thing. All men perish by the tongue. By the tongue, men are made into poverty. By the tongue, cities are destroyed. All evil comes from the tongue. So this assault's favors of the tongue is a lesser known favor because it is not as good a children's story to tell than the tortoise and the hare, right? You tell your kid tongue, you get quite confused. But within it comes great wisdom. For from the tongue, the best can come and the worst can come as well. Just in case you think that the Bible is like that, it's about Epsos favor, some kind of nice story or the three monkey kind of a favor. I want to once again remind you that when we look at the word of God, especially in the Reformed Evangelical Church, we understand the word of God to be the truth of God. And so it's not just one of the many wisdoms out there or one of the many proverbs out there. Indeed, for James chapter 3, the understanding of the tongue is elevated to a position that far surpasses Esau's favor or Confucius' understanding. James defined the tongue as something that can indicate perfection. James chapter 3, verse 1, we have read last week. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, the Bible says he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. The word perfect in original Greek is teleos, which in translation is perfect as imperfect in all ways. Jesus Christ says you ought to be perfect as your Father is in heaven perfect. And the same word was used, teleos. And so James actually meant that if you do not make a mistake in anything you say, you are perfect the way God is perfect. And Jesus Christ affirmed, or rather James got this from the saying of Jesus Christ, of course. And in Matthew, Jesus Christ taught, 1236, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your word you will be justified, and by your word you will be condemned. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, remember that the Bible does not treat speech 
the way Confucius did or Aesop did. Something that is nice to think about, a nice recommendation. Not so. The Bible treats it with all seriousness. Jesus Christ said every single careless word will be accounted for. But don't be too freaked out by this. Huh? Because if you are a Christian and you are saved by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, then that part is absorbed from you. But what Christ meant in verse 37 is very right. For by your word you will be justified, and by your word you will be condemned. And so the definition of perfection, one of the definitions of perfection is when you are able to control your speech and not stumble in any way. But of course, none can make it. The act of speech, therefore, is an action with eternal consequences. Not just something that you say and then get over it. Because every careless word counts. But James also tells us at the end of the day that by so doing, we can gauge the spirituality of a person by the way he controls his tongue. This is especially so when the person lets down his guard and the truth about a person will come forth in due time. Now, some people are, of course, very guarded in the way they speak. The Bible, of course, is talking about when you really expose how you feel. And it comes sometimes with time. It comes sometimes when people are more relaxed with you. I once attended a wedding. The father of the bride said that in order to gauge his son-in-law, who is very careful in his speech, he wanted to find out how he is actually like. So he went to ask his friends, you know, what to do. And his friends said, make him drunk la. And the father of the bride said, I collaborated with my wife. We brought Macallan Scottish whiskey for him. And we called him to a house. We make him drink. Because the Chinese said, Jiu ho tu zhen yan. That means after you drink wine and you get drunk, the truth will come out. In the end, he didn't realize that the potential son-in-law is a very good drinker. So both him and his wife both get drunk first. Um, but I tell you, this morning, that's not a good solution. Because when you get drunk, it's not true that you were too zhen yan. When you get drunk, you talk nonsense. And Yeah, I guess sometimes some things in your heart will come out, but not all the time. So it's not a good deal to, to, to reflect. However, it is true that when the gut is down, when you're more relaxed, then what is in your heart will come forth. All husband and wife know that. I think a relationship within a marriage is the one that I, I've always tell couples before me, that where you become the best of who you are and you become the worst of who you are. I don't think it's possible to hide from your spouse everything for many, many years, especially if you are very close to each other. Because somewhere, somehow, some, at some occasion, what is in your heart must come forth. And so this is the case also for servants of God, Sometimes you meet a lot of servants of God, pastors and all that, and you know, especially for Chinese in the Chinese-speaking church, I, I'm always a bit more uncomfortable with the Chinese culture because Chinese culture has a lot of mannerism. So, you know, and I'm actually very bicultural, but my basic training is still in Western culture. So I get a bit uncomfortable because the Chinese always have all kinds of mannerism depending on your ranking. Okay, 你做,你做,我做,你做,你做,你做,你做,我做,你做. I was always just going and you know, just sit down there. And, and, and you have all this issue. And you can't quite tell what people are like because they use all kinds of words. And Confucian uh, uh, teaching influenced the world in that way. Your Korean drama, I don't know whether you notice or not. They even have words like I, you, uh, depending on the ranking. So when you talk to your mother, the evil mother-in-law, you must always use the you, which is a different you than the way we are familiar with, a more honorable words. But what's truly behind it comes after a while. And so even servants of God, after you get to know them better, after a few years or after a few while, and you travel together, you stay in the same uh, place and you deal with the same thing, then the truth comes out. And so by the word, you can gauge the spirituality. And, but the fact is that no one can make it. So number one, if you will not stumble in anything, you say you are perfect. And number two, James says no one can make it. James 3, 7, For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tam the tongue. No, none. So from the Bible, you at least know two things now. Number one, that if you are able to control your tongue perfectly, you are perfect the way God in heaven is perfect. 
And number two, no one can do it because we are all fallen. And the key reason behind this is because it is just not an, simply an act of speech. Jesus Christ described it this way in Matthew 15, 18, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. So this is in your second responsive reading today. Jesus said, it is not what that go into your mouth that condemn you, but what comes out of your mouth? Because what comes out of your mouth actually comes from your heart. And this is a consistent teaching of Jesus Christ in an earlier chapter, Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, and make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, all of us, when we speak, when we express ourselves, even if you are mute, you use sign language, when you express yourself either in spoken words or even in written words, Jesus Christ said it will be out of the abundance of your heart. You may be able to hide it quite well for a while, but in due time, what's in your heart will be expressed in your speech and in the words even when you write. Because what you say reflect what is deeply in your heart. And therefore, the Bible considers the tongue as a litmus test for the heart. For the tongue will express the entire range of human wickedness because it spews words that will come from the fallen human heart. And in this, the Bible is very damning. So James chapter 3 is just one of the many, many passages in the Bible that talks about the horrifying effect of the heart. Let's look at some of the things that James says. James 3.5 how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire from hell and restless evil, full of deadly poison. I want to draw your attention to the idea of fire that James has highlighted. Now, other portion of the Bible writes a lot of things about the evil of the tongue, but James seems to focus on this idea of a fire, especially uh, one, two, three, four, the fourth one, uh, the fifth one, set on fire by hell. The word hell that James used is giniga, which is a kind of a dump site on the southern part of Jerusalem back in his days, which is a dump site used for burning rubbish. So church history shows that there's a place where the Israelites would throw all their rubbish together, and there's always a fire there burning uh, all the time. And that kind of fire will continue to burn and burn and burn and consume uh, all the kind of garbage all around. And the same word is used to signify hell in the Bible. The Bible places emphasis on the idea that when you use words, you not only are able to harm one person, the individual beside you, you are also lighting a fire that will consume a lot more things. Now, every time when it comes to summer in Australia, people are in California, places like that, they are very afraid of bushfire. You know what bushfire is? Where the whole place is so dry, and you go and flick one cigarette butt into the bush, the punishment is very, very severe, you know. Because from that tiny little spark, then acres upon acres of land will be burned because the fire will consume it all. And the Bible wants to remind us that that is one of the most horrifying things about a tongue that is not controlled. And indeed, that is the thing that I've witnessed a lot in my ministry. So combining all these things together, I'm keenly aware that when I speak, I want to be very careful with my words. But at the same time, when I deal with people and listen to them speak, I know that their words can have severe consequences. And because of that, I can also tell the spirituality of that person. When I first started working with our senior pastor, there was a theologian from a prominent local seminary that summoned me to his house. And I was wondering why. Because, you know, I started translating with Dr. Tong in 1997. A guy sat me down and he said to me, now, mind you, this guy is a very prominent theologian till today, you know. And he said, I heard that you are working with this Stephen Tong guy. I said, yeah, I'm translating for him. And he said, you know, uh, you have to be careful. I said, why? And this theologian said, I heard that he is corrupt. I heard that he's corrupt. That he will take money uh, 
And by the way, I also heard that you are working for this Reverend ABC guy. He's another uh, person that I, I, I work with at that time. And I said, mm, yeah, why? He said, you shouldn't work with him and Dr. Tong. I said, why not? He said, because I heard that Reverend ABC is a closet homosexual and you quite good looking, so he may go after you. <laughs> and yeah, back then I was a bit better looking, I think. <laughs> and you know, the things that I'm preaching to you now, I, I didn't just discover it yesterday, you know what I mean? Uh, I read, read the Bible and I knew that the Bible taught like that. And I was, it, it took me a while to, to, to study myself because it's very difficult to understand this because I've heard this guy before, this particular guy was talking to me, very prominent, respected kind of a theologian. And I was like, wow, you know, why would he even say that? Do you have proof? Do you have, do you have proof? I asked him. He said, no, I, I, this guy, I heard from this guy who hear from this guy, which is a very difficult thing, right? You know, like, like whenever you talk to people, I tell you, I don't go and tell anyone. Uh. Next thing you know, the whole world knows, right? It's this, this whole thing, you know. I, mean, I hear this from here, this, I hear that, I hear that. And the couple of conclusions that came very strictly in my mind, and first of all, my respect for this theologian, pom dropped like a stone. Because he has no proof whatsoever, no solid evidence, these are all hearsay, isn't it? And the second thing I learned is that some hearsays are worse than other hearsays. And this is called the pink elephant effect. If you use the word pink elephant, uh, is there such a thing as pink elephant in the world? No, right? But once I use the word pink elephant, immediately in your mind, you are imagining an elephant that is pink in color. Doesn't matter that the elephant does not exist. It is already in your mind. And so in the same manner, if you go around whispering to people's ear, hey, I hear this Yong Teng Ming guy is very chico pay, you know, he, uh, he, I heard that he always got beautiful wife, not enough, must go for another one. I thought we saw in JB another kid run around look exactly like him. No? <laughs> then he said, who tell you? Uh, cannot tell you. La. The guy who tell me, tell me that I cannot tell people. But I tell you, it's very real. And whether or not I am a terrible, I am by the way, but I guarantee you there's no little young Teng Ming running around in JB. <laughs> that one cannot escape. But the pink elephant effect has happened. You were in your mind straight away as this imagination that your pastor is some guy that have mistresses or fool around and is a hypocrite and what have you. And that is where the big danger and the evil is. And not the last one. James says that the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And I have been observing this all the time not only warning myself against it, but observing it right in the midst of ministry happening. Restless evil. Reminds me of what the Apostle Peter says. The devil prowl around like a lion, looking for people that he can devour. And we often thought that it's just worse. So simple. It's not so simple. Restless evil. It's always trying to create trouble, always looking out for opportunity to hit the people of God, the devil is always doing that. And one of the key things that the Bible tells us he does is through the tongue. And so in observation, I see it all the time. Whether it's in the Reformed Evangelical Movement, in Habitat for Humanity's work, in the work we do anywhere. And I tell you that every time something good happens in your life, whether it's in ministry, even in your marriage, the devil is restless and he will move. And one of the most powerful weapon he has is to use the restless tongue because the restless tongue is a weapon of mass destruction and it will destroy us all if we do not handle it carefully or are not aware of its danger. And so every single time I have a ministry that is working well, I sense and I observe the presence of tongue speaking, people coming out with careless words all over the place. And it's very scary. And just recently, with my co-workers in Habitat, we were talking about something. So I was telling them that, oh, you know, based on the Bible, we must do ABC and not do DEF. Immediately, right immediately, the second I finished speaking, 
and then we say, okay, let's discuss this. Everybody is doing DEF and talking about it too. Oh, this stupid idea about ABC is just dumb. And I was like, wow, you know, where did this come from, right? Immediately, the, the people started talking and being lured away. And I have to step in and say, look here, look here. I just told all of you to be very careful. And in one of the most recent horrifying things that I encountered, we were, a whole bunch of us as church leaders were trying to deal with a tricky situation. And so I was aware of the importance of the tongue and the misuse of the tongue. And I warned the people first before we even go into discussion. And I say in prayer, we have to be very careful. The devil is prowling everywhere. And we have to be very careful with what we say. If you don't have evidence, don't spill it out of your mouth. If you, if you, if you think that you heard about something about someone and you don't have firm evidence of it, don't talk about it. So I kept warning the people. And to my horror, when we went into discussion, the same thing happened. People talk about hearsay. I heard this about this guy. And then, oh, it's just crazy, right? And this verse reminds me of all that. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, remember this, that your tongue, it can be a weapon of mass destruction. And the devil is restless. And you make your tongue restless as well. But the most important thing it will seem is in the next verse. James says in 3.9, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And as Sister Ines read earlier, then he says, you know, you don't have a tree that bears two fruit. You don't have a stream that is both salty and not salty at the same time. It ought not to be so. And I think that this is the key focus that gives rise to the emphasis of how horrifying the tongue is. Because with the same mouth, you praise God in a setting like this. Or for a person like me, I preach the sermon, the word of God with this mouth. But at the same time, using the same mouth, I curse at people or I say bad things about other people. This goes against the biblical principle of how we ought to be before God. Now, some of you read the Old Testament and find it very boring. Old Testament say, okay, you're going to build a temple, you need to do this, you need to do that. You, the, the priest need to do this, you need to follow a lot of rules and regulations. The whole principle behind it is that God is holy. And you come close to God, He demands the best of the best of the best of you as well. Now, of course, we can never be like that. And so with the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed, we go into the most holy place. But there is a reason why it's called the most holy place. And if you follow the principle of Old Testament, it is so scary that a priest that goes into the most holy place, according to Jewish tradition, has to have a rope tied on him, you know. Because the most holy place, he can only enter it, the priest, and only once a year. And so if he go into the most holy place, and the wrath of God is incurred, and he's struck dead huh, in the most holy place, then the people outside will yank him out with the rope. They cannot enter it himself. So in the holiest of holiest, don't play play. You cannot have a single thing that is apart from the absolute demand of God. And so in the Bible, we see cases like this. In Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah first saw the proximity of God, the first thing he said, chapter 6 verse 5, and I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So the first realization that Isaiah had is that with this mouth, I have used this vessel that's very, very unclean to praise God. Because I praise God and then after that I gossip about people or I say bad things about other people, not founded. Whether it's my wife, my spouse, my children, the society, Lee Kuan Yew, whatever, you know, I, I do that. And so that is something that is most horrifying because from the same vessel you are using to praise God and at the same time you are using the same vessel to curse at man. So in essence, you are using a very dirty and stained vessel to try to worship God. And so all the Old Testament principle of who God is and the wrath of God will then come upon us. So that's all the terrible thing that the tongue has. But I want to steer the sermon to a more positive uh, part as well. Now, from the teaching of James, it also tells us that the tongue can be a means of spiritual growth as well. Because going back to the verse just now, James says, if you are able to not stumble in what he say, this person is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Therefore, 
while we all already know that we are not perfect, none of us can control the tongue, the teaching of James also means that the control of the tongue will lead to the control of our entire being. John MacArthur Jr. put it this way, the control of the tongue is more than an evidence of spiritual maturity. Right? I told you. So I can tell quite soundly the spirituality of a servant of God by the things that he say. Some, uh, oftentimes when his guard is down and when he is careless. That's true. The Bible says so. At the same time, the control of the tongue can also by a means to which you can attain spirituality. And you know from the earlier reading, James used the example of the horse, the bit in the horse. As small as a bit is, it controls the horse left and right. Anybody ride horses here? Anyone? No? Really? Some of you, right? I've tried once, the horse threw me out, and then <laughs> after that I refused. It's quite a scary thing. You know? But the horse is... I, I find it a bit cruel, you know, because you put the thing in the... Oh, 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 and the horse is not happy to serve you, actually. It's just trained to do so. But it's fully controlled by that bit. Tiny, tiny bit, it controls a huge horse. Horses are quite big, okay? Not those pony, I mean the real Arabian kind of horse. And James also used the example of a rudder of a sheep. The rudder is this small little thing here, you know, if you can see. That controls the whole giant body of the sheep. So herein lies a wonderful and positive principle from this morning sermon because I don't know, maybe you sit down there, you keep listening to this and you hear hey, quite terrible, I just cannot do this. The positive answer is that the tongue not only reflects spirituality, it can also be a means to which you achieve greater spiritual maturity because the tongue is the easiest, fastest and most powerful tool we have for sinning. You know that? Easiest, fastest, most powerful tool we have for sinning because you open your golden mouth, you can sin very fast and you can create a lot of problems lighting fire go around whispering hey Yong Teng Ming this is there. he got a kid in JB that one very fast the actual having a kid in JB running around is a lot more complicated am I right I must go and travel to JB la. I must go and look for a girl I like la. I must first quarrel with my wife la. and then and then after that have evil thoughts in my heart la. Then after that, I must have a relationship with this woman. Then she must get pregnant, right? I mean, that's the other thing. And then she, she'll come and see me, and then, or rather call me. Then you can have abortion, no abortion. Then Christian, we don't abort. Then you have a kid. Then you have a kid. How? Very, very complicated compared to just opening your golden mouth and say, hey, this young man may have a kid looking like him in JB running around. So the tongue is a lot faster. So the control over the greater means easier control over the lesser. If I'm able to control my tongue, which is a lot faster, more powerful, then surely I'm able to control not going to JB. You know what I mean? Because that one is a lot harder. So in this principle, the control over the faster means of sinning, the impulse will mean control over the slower impulses as well. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may I urge you this morning, after learning about the evils of the tongue, to also think about the means of spiritual growth. Let your tongue turn from your ways to God's way, that you will even surrender your speech to God, because the Bible points it out as a restless evil. And there are many, many things you need to do. The Bible has many, many teachings about how a godly tongue can be such a blessing. And the first thing I will encourage you to do is to first get your heart right. Because as Jesus Christ said, what comes forth from your mouth is often, in fact, all the time, out of the abundance of your heart. And this is the one verse that I want to encourage you to remember and memorize even. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And the word thing, the heart, the mind, they are all linked in the writings of the Bible. What Paul is saying is what I've always told you, right? In your life, there's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of crossroads. You come to a crossroad, do I turn right, do I turn left? Do I want to be kind or do I want to be mean? Before I open my mouth and say something to my husband, to my wife, to my child, to my girlfriend, my boyfriend, to my parents, do I want to 
choose words that is kind or choose words that is mean. And that has to do with how you think. When you look at someone do something, do you want to think positive or do you want to think negative? And oftentimes we get into trouble, husband and wife get into trouble because of the word assume. I've shown you this before. Assume, A-S-S-U, me. It make an S out of you and me. And I tell you, I learned this so many years ago, right? We just, by God's grace, passed our 27th year wedding anniversary. Till today, I'm still making the mistake, you know. Very often time, you assume. Why? One look, I know, ma, you know, I married you so many years, 27 years. The Chinese say, 放个屁,我都知道你在想什么, you know. It, not true, right? You know that it's not true because you always assume. And, and when you assume, you always choose to think negative first. And I tell you, after 27 years of marriage, and I think even times two, 54, but Linda was the one who said double E, right? Times two, 54 years, if by God's grace, it will still be the same because we are terrible fallen people. We will always be assuming. The verse challenged us to pause. Instead of assuming the negative, you think on the positive side. You always look at what is done. And I tell you, it takes a lifelong practice and discipline, right? Singaporean mother always do this kind of thing. Kid come back with a piece of paper. Mother, I made 90 marks in my math exam. Many Singaporeans' parents, instead of saying, oh, that's wonderful, immediately will ask, what about John? What about Matthew? What about Elizabeth? What did they do? That is a crossroad decision. Instead of thinking positive, all the good things that the Bible says you ought to think about and focus about, about your child, you go and find that one thing that is missing, you know? And that's something that from the heart that you need to spend your entire life getting right. Philippians also says, 2, 3, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Count others better than yourself. Can you do that? Look at your spouse. Do you consider your spouse better than you? Or you think she's very stupid, eh? you know? You know, I'm so much smarter. My IQ point is three digit one. Her IQ point is only two digit kind of thing. Is, is that what it's all about? The Bible says no. You've got to consider others more significant than yourself. Not to say that you come up with a false front, but what the Bible is saying is that you always need to go and think about what's so wonderful about another person because certainly you cannot be better than anybody else. Not only that, James gave us a very good uh, teaching be slow to speak. We have preached about this before. James 1.19, Know this, my beloved brother, let every person be slow, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Proverbs 10.19, When words are many, transgressions is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lip is prudent. So this is another discipline. Be slow to speak. Don't immediately jump out and give your opinion, especially when ministry work is involved. Very fast, you want to gossip. Very fast, I cannot, cannot help it. I must quickly tell you what's wrong with another person. The Bible says be slow to speak and be very, very careful before you open your mouth. And the Bible also tells us that when you speak, always choose to encourage and not corrupt. Ephesians 4.29, Paul says, Let no corrupting thought comes out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Parents, when you look at your kid, do you encourage them more than you discourage them? What, what, what do you think? You know, I, I, when I was young, I was told that one of the ways is to record yourself from morning to night and then after that, go and listen to yourself. You'll be quite horrified, you know, what, what you say, as, especially as parents. What, what are the words you use for your children? Do you tell your kid, hey, you're useless, are you? Huh? Chinese, unfortunately, have that kind of a tradition. We, we, I don't know, Chinese culture teaches that you better don't praise your kid too much. So I'm brought up without praises. My father has never said I love you before to me ever in my life. Uh, should I cry now? No. <laughs> it, it, and then the, the Cantonese always says, Sang go cha siu go go sang lei. You know, give birth to a piece of cha siu, better give birth to you. Like, well, since I was young, I keep wondering, what do you mean? How to give birth to cha siu? You know? <laughs> My mother always say, keep the dog better than keep all of you. 
But when she scolds, she scolds all four of us. La, so okay, la, I'm one of the four. Never mind. You know, we keep the dog better than keep you. I, in the earlier days, maybe it's okay. La, we're very tough people. You know, very hard. The mother can keep the dog. Yeah, sure. You know, who cares? But these days, is that the case? I think our children are growing up in a very different world. So you have to choose your words very carefully, right? Some kids are really, really hurt when you tell the kids they're useless, you know. <laughs> you know, it's like, I actually don't want you, you know. You are accident, you know. <laughs> or, or we pick you up from somewhere in a garbage bin or something like that. It's, it's like that, culturally. So we need to be very careful. The Bible says you build up the character of a person rather than put him down. Not to, to mean that you just always not tell the truth, you know, but you must be biased towards building up as opposed to corrupting the person. And the Bible also says that when we use words, always choose gracious words, not hurtful words. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Here you see a kind of teaching from the Apostle Paul when he talks about answering people. So it's like an argument, you know. When you want to put a point across, Paul says, let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt. Meaning you don't just open your mouth and say whatever you think. Some people have the mistaken notion that I'm who I am. I say what I want. Husband and wife, right? Husband always, I say what I want. You should appreciate it, okay? i very honest with you. I say what you want. Not a good idea. The Bible says you ought to be very careful because words hurt. And you can always put words differently. So one of the suggestions I always give married couple is that instead of saying you, 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 you all the time, you should try to use the word I more often. Like I feel this way. I feel unhappy. I feel anger. I feel disappointed. Because you're expressing your own feeling and it's fine because no matter how that's the way you feel and there's no judgment to it. But when you use the word you too often, there's always a problem. You, 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 you. And don't point away. Okay? You, 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 uh, marry you, uh, marry you, you, uh, you, uh, swear, uh, you, uh, you, marry swear, you, this, you, that. Uh, you always do this to me. You, 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 you. You point one finger there, or four finger pointing back at you, you know, can you see that? And when you say you, the other party must defend himself. And therefore, they'll come and say, me, you also, okay? Uh, who, you, I marry you, think very good. Uh. And then, da, pong, kaboom, kaboom. The whole thing, kaboom. Weapons of mass destruction, the volcanic explosion happen. What is important is to, like the Bible says, Learn the art of speech sometimes to control your tongue and speak appropriately. Doesn't mean that you hide all your feelings inside, but you express it in an appropriate manner. You tell people how you feel about things so that other party will know how you feel, and then you deal with it and you agree to disagree with that. The art of speech, the Bible described in a very beautiful way, Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. That means if you know how to season your word with speech, you are able to reach many people and speak to them properly. Instead of saying, this is who I am, that's how I speak. I'm very straight, one. I'm very blunt. No, that's not what the Bible says we ought to do. Gracious word, not hurtful word. And above all, one of the most important verses in the Bible is this. You speak always with love. Ephesians 4.15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So here again you see the power of the word. So my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have read from James 3 all the evils and the potential danger, weapons of mass destruction that exist in your tongue. But I want to end the sermon by encouraging you to also recognize that the tongue can also be a means to spirituality. And this is not just a simple recommendation, you know. It is a very concise and very precise teaching from the Bible that whoever is able to control his tongue is a person who is very, very close to Jesus Christ. So I want to end the sermon by asking you to resolve within yourself with the Lord this morning to surrender your tongue to God that you will resolve to speak encouraging word, to speak gracious word, to speak words always in love. This is not going to be a wave of a magic wand where tomorrow you suddenly speak with grace and whatever. But it is a determination in your life 
to want to be obedient to the word of God. And as I emphasize over and over again, not only is the teaching about the evil of the tongue, it also gives us a means, very simple but very effective means towards spiritual maturity. And it may take you a while, certainly it's taking me forever, but it is something that the Bible tells us we ought to do. So may we commit our life to God this way, starting from the humble but most powerful tongue. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for your word that so wonderfully tells us what we should be doing. And in this morning, we have heard from James how the tongue can be such a horrifying thing, but at the same time, it gives us the encouragement that we can progress spiritually, starting with the control of our tongue. Help us, O oh God, to be resolved to always speak gracious word and not hurtful word, to always be encouraging, to always speak the truth, not because we want to be better than other people or to prove that others are wrong and we are right, but we want to speak the truth in love. And so by so doing, we continue to learn to grow, to be more and more like Jesus Christ, as Paul has said to us, that we will grow up in every way into Christ-likeness in our life. But it's a very tough thing for many of us. Some of us grow up with habits that we pick up from the world. Some of us have very mistaken notion about what the world says about all these things. But whatever the case may be, help us to surrender ourselves to you, to listen to you, and to do what you say we ought to do, rather than listening to our own thinking and the 1,001 voices out there in the world. What a wonderful life we would be if we will only be able to do exactly as your word has said. So let us make the first step and let us commit to you our life that we will do this so that people will look at us and say that this person is very close to Jesus Christ because of the words he said, always encouraging, always gracious, always kind, and always truthful in love. Listen to our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.